You didn't have anything to do with it. No. You were in a car with all this stolen stuff in it. You had nothing to do about it. No. You knew it was there? Yeah. Okay, now we got possession of stolen property. Felony. Okay. But you had nothing to do with it. No. So what did you need the money for? Well, I had to pay some of my court costs from another thing I got in trouble for. Oh, so he took the money from stealing the stuff. I have enough to charge him now with burglary. Simple as that. Well, did you see the picture on that camera of the house with the uh, Christmas decorations? This is a real case scenario. Yeah, did you go in that house? No, I didn't go into that one. <laughs> so there's ways around it. There's ways to get around people who try not to talk to you. And again, as Professor Dwayne said, if you wanted to go and say you wanted to go into a boxing match, $100 if you win. You've never boxed before. You have to face somebody who's an Olympic boxer. You're going to lose. You're going to face somebody who's been interviewing people for, in my case, 28 years. You're going to lose, unless you're purely innocent. Now, on the other side of it, I don't want to put anyone that's innocent in jail. But I try not to bring anyone into the interview room that's innocent. And there are a couple that I have let walk away because they were innocent. Okay, the interviews. How do we approach the interviews? There's a number of ways to approach interviews. There's a number of types of people that I deal with. First thing I do, anyone know what they get told first when they're in an interview? Miranda. Miranda warning. Okay, it's not a right. You don't have a right to Miranda. Those rights have always been there. It's called the Constitution. You're just teaching. You're doing a real quick class on the Constitution for these people. Usually they don't listen to it. And this is the way I give my Miranda warning. Look, I have to tell you this. Just pay attention. Okay, they're usually sitting back or they're very attentive. You have the right to remain silent. Do you understand that? Yes. Anything you say may be used against you in a court. I don't have to say it will be. I say it may be. Okay, and they get that. You have a right to an attorney, and if you can't afford one, one may be appointed to represent you. Got that. You can decide not to talk, quit talking to me at any time and exercise these rights. Do you understand that? Sure. Now, before I do the primary thing that's needed with those rights, and that's to get a waiver, I say, now, before you say anything, let me tell you what I know. And over all the time I've had to put together what this individual was supposedly involved in, and I only say supposedly because Professor Duane's sitting over there, <laughs> that this individual was involved in, I will tell the story that I've put together, and it'll be pretty close to what happened. And I can see that it's pretty close to what happened because that individual starts slumping down in their chair. They'll put their hand to their face, doing this in their mind. Oh, my God, I'm going to jail forever. Okay? And I can see it. And I said, now that you know what I know, do you want to talk to me? And why do I do that? Because if I didn't do that, is if I said, do you want to talk to me, they'll say no. So I give them the time to think about And then comes the next phrase. Now, before you start talking to me, let me tell you the difference between a lie and a truth. If you lie to me and I get before the judge and I tell the judge that you were dishonest with me, that's just not going to make them happy. But if I get before the judge and tell them you're honest, straightforward, willing to take uh, responsibility for your actions, that is going to help you. That's not a lie, though. That is true. In Virginia Beach courts, it will help them. You know, They may not get five years. They may get three years. They're still going to prison. Or they're still going to have a felony, but it will help them. And then I have to determine what kind of person I have. And there's two types. There's the one, like I mentioned to you earlier, where I have to talk to them, talk to them about different things, get into their own skin, as the word is, and try and get them to talk to me and discuss things. I had a sexual assault case. I had to talk to the guy how hot the woman was, and I understand where he was coming from. And when, that, when I said that, we were buds. And he started talking to me. And he's still sitting in prison. Okay, So you've got to get in there and you've got to go places. The other side is, I can't try and act like that individual acts. Okay, I can't try and act like what we call lovingly a hood rat. I can't try and act and talk like him. Because I'm an older white guy. We don't talk like that. And that would be an insult. And you can't insult people. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter where they grew up. It doesn't matter where they're from. You can't insult people like that. You have to be yourself. 
So you have to get in, into their mindset and the way they're thinking and have a discussion with them. The other type of person is the one that likes to tell a story. This young man, great man, I, I love him to death. He didn't go to jail because I went to bat for him because I felt sorry for him. He was a newlywed. He was having money problems. Former Marine. I said, tell me what happened. And he told me this beautiful story about what happened. What he had done is he had sold a piece of equipment that his ex-employer had had that he had stolen. He told me the beautiful story of what happened about him finding it on the side of the road and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't even question about him after he finished his whole story. Very unplausible, but very beautiful story. I sat there and listened to it for 15 minutes. I looked at him and I said, you stole the stuff from your boss, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. <laughs> I had nothing. I really had nothing except the fact that he had sold it. So there's, t there's those types of people. And then the third type, the one who tries to be the hood, who tries to be the criminal, who cries like a baby when they walk in a jail, but when they're on the street, they're as tough, tough as rocks. You go in there with your paperwork, you sit down, and you just start doing paperwork. And usually I have a videotape sitting on top of it, just for measure, so they think I have a videotape. And you just sit there. Don't tell them Miranda. Just sit there and wait for them to start talking, because they will. They want to talk. People want to communicate. They hate silence. That's why when people speak, you hear, uh, hmm, when they're talking, because they need to fill that void with something. People hate silence. So that's another way. So, so you see how there's an unlevel playing field here. Even with, with the most educated individual, there's an unlevel playing field. If you talk to the police, everything's going to be written down. If you get pulled over for, for a, a ticket, they give you the ticket and you pull off. You ever see the cop pull off right after you? Usually not. That's because on the back of their ticket, they're writing down everything you said. And it's going to come into court if you go to court. Everything that's said, I write down. Every phone call I make has to have a listening device on it. Is that illegal? How many parties need to know that a uh, phone conversation in Virginia is being recorded? One, me, I knew it was recorded. I get many, many confessions over the phone. Okay, back to the people. Yes, they're stupid. Okay, people are stupid. I had a young man who told me straight up, I'm going to college, I'm going to law school. I'm too smart, you'll never find out what happened. He was going to uh, Tidewater Community College, the law school of, I suppose, Tidewater Community <laughs> College. He was the partner to the one who I told you the interview about just a little while ago where I would ask him what he needed the money for. He was his partner. And he was very smart, so he thought. He thought he was a very intelligent individual. I ended up arresting him five times out of his house. His mother hated me. She liked me the first time. She apologized. She didn't really like me much the second time. It got to the point where she really hated me after that. He's doing eight years upstate. He's very smart because he decided to tell me how smart he was. And in telling me how smart he was, he let it slip that he doesn't sell stolen stuff to pawn shops. He sells it to flea markets because they do not have to report to the state. I know how to drive to a flea market just as good as anyone else and go look for stuff that I'm looking for. So. He was trying to impress me with his ability to be smarter than I was, and he confessed. So people are inherently uh, stupid, especially criminals. Now, and don't get me wrong, there are some very intelligent criminals out there, and most of them work in really big office buildings and wear suits. <laughs> <laughs> yep, she went to jail. Is she hurting? No. Uh, but there are some very intelligent street criminals out there as well that get other people to do their bidding and so forth and so on, and people are afraid to turn on them. But there are some very foolish people. Uh, just a couple other things. I do a thing usually with younger people, usually between the age of, uh, I try not to deal too much with juveniles, but between the age of 16 and, and 25, is once they've talked to me. Now, let's back up a little bit. You don't need a recording in court for a statement. As Professor Duane said, it's his word against my word if he was a defendant. 
Number one, and this is the way it works, and this is the way the real world works, in case you guys haven't been out there, that's outside the windows out there. The jury looks at a defendant sitting next to a, pros a uh, defense attorney. That's strike one, because the jury is already looking at that, some as that being someone who did something that put them in that chair. Number two, they get a uniformed police officer up there. They get someone wearing a suit as a detective up there that is a professional witness. That's strike two. So now they have a professional witness against them. And then if they've confessed and that professional witness is going to sit there and read from his or her notes, the confession, that's strike three. Go get your orange jumpsuit. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. So they have all those strikes against them. And I know you're innocent until proven guilty, but it's a jury of your peers. And the perception is if you're sitting next to a defense attorney, you have to prove you're innocent. And that's, that's just the perception of, of a lot of the jury, no matter how many jury instructions they get, they still perceive that person is a hoodlum, is a criminal. And no matter how hard some defense attorneys try to put their clients in suits and have them sit up at the table, if the trial is a long trial, they fall back to their old ways and they start acting and speaking in a way that's not very good for their case. So saying that, you don't have to have a recording. My suppression hearing, a statement was trying to be suppressed because when I record a confession or an interview, because we don't do interrogations, the police, we do not do interrogations. That's a bad, mean, Nazi kind of word, okay? We do interviews, okay? And you'd be amazed how much difference it makes when you use that one, one word, vice is interrogation. I'll take it off the tape and I'll have my secretary put it to paper. Immediately afterwards, I'll take that tape and I'll scan it over my magnet, throw it in my box so I can use it again. I do not keep the tape. It is not evidence. It's not required to be evidence. It is there. If it's there for the court, it's just extra. You don't have to have that. But it's really good to have. The suppression hearing, he tried to suppress that after I testified. The defense counsel stood up and says, well, judge, I really don't have anything to say. And the judge, Judge Canada, said, motion denied and let's move on and go to court. So you don't have to have recordings. You don't have to have videotapes. The police videotapes, that's just extra. If you got that police officer sitting there testifying, you don't have to have that videotape. You got the guy that was right there to tell you what happened. But it's always nice to have those extra things. And what I do for these young people is I'll say, look, the person who you broke into their house are very upset. They're very angry because you sold their stuff to the pawn shop. Pawn shop stuff sold them. They don't get their stuff back. They're very angry. They want you to go to prison. Okay? They may be very angry. They want you to go to prison. They may want to. To lessen that, that's the start of what's commonly known as a lie because we are allowed to lie in interviews. To lessen that, you might want to make them happy. And the reason that's a lie is because when it is a felony in Commonwealth of Virginia, the victim has nothing to do with the prosecution or how long the people go to prison or any of that kind of stuff. We're prosecuting them, not the victim. But to lessen that, what I'd like you to do is write an apology letter to the person whose house you broke into. Just write it out. Well, how do I write it? In your own words, just write, you know, I'm sorry for what I did. Then say that, you know, when I broke into your house the other night, whatever. They write it out. They sign it. I sign it as a witness. I put the date and the time that it was written. I give it to the Commonwealth's attorney. It's entered as evidence as a written confession in the person's own handwriting. I don't type it up again and have them sign it. In their handwriting, a written confession. Is that person going to get convicted? I have never seen them not get convicted on that, on an apology letter. So, in support of Professor Duane, everything he says is right. That's what I do. This is a test of the emergency bomb hit system. This is only a test. This is a test of the emergency bong hit system. The bong hitters in your area and voluntary defiance of federal, state, and local authorities have developed this system to keep you informed in the event of a bong hit emergency. If this had been an actual emergency, the attention signal you just heard would have been followed by official supply information, police scanner news, and emergency bong hitting instructions. This concludes this test of the emergency bong hit system. Quit playing games with God! <laughs> 
Wake up, America. 